All right, so we are going to talk about the two uh, probably uh, most uh, famous and influential of the Reformed Confessions that get written as kind of the fruit of the Reformation. And this is kind of the, the maturation, you could say, in many ways, of the Reformation. If you think of it this way, if at the end of the day, what defines a church is not the succession of its bishops going back to any particular bishop historically, if it's not the structure of the church itself, what is the centerpiece of the Christian church? Well, for those who believe that we're justified by grace alone through faith alone, the center of a church is its faith, its confession, its set of beliefs. And so in the Protestant world, following the Reformation, what's going to define different branches of that Protestant tree is their confession of faith. And see, this is a beautiful thing for us. I mean, obviously, even within our confessions of faith, we'd say there's, you know, the, the absolutely central points. We can look at people who are not Reformed, maybe Lutheran, and we can look at people who are Baptist and Anglican and these different things and go, for what we differ in regard to, say, our ecclesiology or the structure of the church or even how we do the sacraments, we can go, we share a common faith. The heart of our confessions are the same. And so that is really what the age, the whole 17th century, you know, becomes. It's an age of, of confession writing. And people aren't aware of this, but there are actually scores and scores of Reformed confessions that got written by bigger and smaller groups. It just happens to be, these are the bigger ones, This what is the product of the Synod of Dort the Canons of Dort, and the Westminster Assembly. So I'll walk you through um, both of these, beginning with uh, the impetus for uh, the Synod of Dort, which is the Remonstrants and the, the followers of um, Jacob Arminius. All right, so let me tell you about Arminius, and I'll just give you a, a general flavor of what's going on in the Netherlands at this time. Um, the Netherlands um, and uh, what is now Belgium, you know, kind of, you think of your Europe map, they share a border, and um, it's really kind of functionally the same peoples are working there. Now, Jacob Arminius, in his early life, he's born in Udovater, Holland, and he um, studies at Utrecht, Marburg, and Leiden. And these are all centers of Reformed Christianity at this point. Um, so he's not imbibing Lutheranism primarily, he's imbibing from the Calvinist tradition. And um, he gets a scholarship to go to Geneva, which is obviously the, that centerpiece of the Reformation. You saw what John Knox had said about it, there was not a more perfect church on earth. It was this place where uh, if you were Reformed, you would go and that's where you would want to learn. Well, here's the thing. Arminius gains something of a reputation from the very beginning as being something of a, a rascally sort of figure, a bit subversive from the get-go. As, as the story goes, he was involved in kind of leading secret lectures of his own even while he was a student in Geneva that were um, subversive to the basic teaching of the, teachings of the Reformed faith. And um, at the time, People didn't think much of it. I mean, I, I think even, you know, on a college campus today, you still have your kind of leading thinkers, thinkers among the student body that might have their own following there. And he was one of those guys. Um, but at this point, his theology is not radically at odds, it would appear, uh, to the Reformation. And he studies under Theodore Beza, which is Calvin's successor in Geneva. So he is the next essentially lead, um, you know, the theological voice in Geneva following Calvin. Anyone know who the third is? A guy named Francis Turretin, who wrote the Institutes of Electric Theology, which is probably the standard piece of systematic theology that you get from, um, from the Reformed Scholastic period. Still a classic, still a fantastic piece of work. Uh, Francis Turretin. So it goes Calvin, Beza, Turretin. Uh, yes. Mm -hmm. All right. So um, he goes back to Holland and he gets an Amsterdam pastorate there. Um, that is to say he is elected um, by the people, which is one of those things that in a Reformed church you're going to have, not mere appointment of a pastor, but obviously he's going to candidate and then you're going to elect to receive him as your pastor. And that happens in 1588. And what he is charged to do in the course of his ministry is to go to a nearby town of Delft, Holland, where there are those who are opposing 
Calvinism the basics of the Reformed faith in terms of how salvation works. And we'll talk about how they opposed it. And Arminius was sent there to refute them. Well, in the process of his engagement with them, he joins the opposition. He is convinced of their particular beliefs, their particular slant on how salvation works. And here's the thing. It's hard to say exactly what Arminius believes because you're going to see in the course of his life, he's evasive. He's always kind of working on a grand system that he wants to rule out. And even his main ideas are primarily going to be published um, in, in, I guess you'd say, their, their sharpest terms by his followers. So in, in some respect, he joins the opposition in 1591. And as opposed to Calvinism, he, uh, it, he's, he's going to believe in Arminianism to speak uh, anachronistically um, as he's going to be the one who formulates it. So um, basically, the, the deal is when he goes back to his Amsterdam um, pastorate is he is supposed to exercise restraint in teaching any of these new ideas. And this is kind of one of those things that in the Reformed faith in general, you can take, have an exception to our confession, even if you are like a PCA minister, but it has to be granted to you by your presbytery. Your presbytery has to go. That exception is not that big of a deal. <laughs> this would actually be a really big deal, but they're, they're in the formative stages of figuring out what's a really big deal. And um, the other thing you're not supposed to do is teach it. If you have a radically different view with things, um, it, it, I don't have the freedom to say, yeah, no, I think the spiritual gifts continue today and I have the gift of prophecy. My latest prophecy is, and you know that's not an option. Um, at this time, um, the, the churches in Holland are uh, subscribing to the Belgic Confession, 1559 by uh, Guido de Brie, and he is, um, he's a martyr for the faith. And again, it's a summary of your doctrine. That's what your confession is. And so he ends up um, getting an appointment, I believe, to the University of Leiden. That's right. And um, he engages in what you would call dishonest subscription. That's you saying, I agree with the doctrinal standards. I agree with this. Um, when you really don't. And it's a big deal. We've had that happen in the PCA. You have it happen in other, you know, denominations where maybe on the front end, they haven't even examined all the doctrine in your confession. And they say, yes, I believe that. Um, but in the course of time, they find out they don't. Well, it's pretty clear Arminius actually didn't believe it from the get-go. And this is what I mean when I talk about kind of a rascally sort of figure um, he's evasive when he is questioned about it, and in many respects, secretive. And, you know, from the secret correspondences with his followers, he talked about this ambition to unite all of the Protestant denominations, essentially, under his um, vision of how salvation works. So he has a grand scheme in mind. And um, basically what's going to happen in the course of his life is he's going to be put on trial. And it, it actually isn't surprising that he, he does suffer a natural death in 1609. He, he would seem to be constantly stressed out, which is what's generally going to happen to you if you're not being fully honest about what your beliefs and, and your convictions are. So he ends up dying a natural death before um, his trial uh, or it's really any major disciplinary action gets taken against him. But before we get to his death, I'll, I'll talk about what happens. So the re remonstrant movement, which, um, which is birthed from him, bursts five ideas. And these ideas, I'll just list them off here, but it's the idea of conditional predestination and election. It's the idea that Jesus died for everybody without exception. It's um, a particular view of depravity that we're going to talk about in a moment, a denial of irresistible grace, and... It's weird, but the fifth point of the remonstrance is they say it may be possible after having once been justified to lose your salvation. We're not sure. So it's a question mark. Later remonstrance in Arminianism is going to be definitively clear. A person can once be justified and lose their justification by some action or activity of their own. Okay? And I'll try to give you a picture of this. So here's the thing. To be Christian and orthodox at all is to believe in something called original sin. That due to Adam's fall, we're all sinful, and we, are, we enter this world depraved. And I'll, I'll let red on, on my chart mean you, you're hellbound. <laughs> um, you enter the world depraved 
Um, your nature imparted to you from Adam is a nature that's at opposition with God. Now, Arminians would say, we believe that. But what happens is, is that when Jesus comes into the world, what he does is he brings about this thing called prevenient grace, which by their understanding of it is a scenario or a condition where everyone who is depraved gets moved into a position where they now are not saved, but they are imparted a newfound power of free will to choose salvation or to not choose salvation. Now, I want you to think about what this, what this means. I mean, this phrase, prevenient grace, it can be used in different theological circles just to mean anything God does before you are regenerate. But for an Arminian, what that means is a point or a condition in your life where God hasn't imparted to you salvation, but he has imparted to you the ability to choose to no longer be uh, shackled in sin and death or to choose um, to continue to be stuck in it. So this is kind of a weird thing. In a way, what they're saying is what Jesus did on the cross is he didn't save anybody. What he did is he made everyone salvable. Do you guys see the difference there? There's a difference between Jesus going to the cross, dying for your sins as a substitute, purchasing you from your condition, purchasing you from death, and purchasing you for the kingdom, and Jesus dying on the cross in such a way, such a way that he makes you salvable. In fact, early um, Arminianism flatly denied a substitutionary atonement. They would either go with something more like a moral influence theory of the atonement, they would go with all of the but they were, they were definitely not believers in substitutionary atonement that your sin goes on Christ, Christ's righteousness goes on you. Because it'd be rather hard to say if that's what happened on the cross in the atonement, anyone for whom that happened would have to be justified, right? Your sin goes on Jesus and his righteousness goes on you. And it's really not actually until John Wesley that you get a version of Arminianism that tries to hang on to substitutionary atonement. Does that make sense? But at this point, it's not tied to substitutionary atonement at all. So their, their theory then is everyone is now kind of in the blue circle, which we'll call saved. They're also still kind of red. So Jesus makes them purple, you might say. They're kind of halfway between. And then the next step in this process is that if you're a believer, you choose to believe in Jesus Christ, you choose to accept his work, that makes you born again. And notice you're, you're much closer to blue at this point than you were in the dark purple. Um, but then if you're an unbeliever, then you've grieved the Holy Spirit and you're kind of going back to deep red over here to just pure depravity, hell-boundedness. And they would say that the terms predestination as used in, in the Bible and, and reprobation as used in theology, here's what it means. God has predestined that anyone who believes will be born again. That is to say, he has decided beforehand, he has determined that anyone, if they should believe in Jesus Christ, then it will necessarily like a, like a domino mean that they will be born again. Reprobation just simply means that God has determined in eternity past that if you should of your own free will not believe, then you will be you will be um, grieving the Spirit and on your way to eternal death. So predestination does not have to do with God predestining Michael to any specific end. It has nothing to do with predestining Callie Bosserman to some specific end. Predestination is just a decision beforehand to destine anyone who happens to be a believer to be born again and even that, as we'll see, is contingent in the mature formation of Arminianism. Even in this condition before death, this guy might go down here. This guy might decide to choose to believe in Jesus and end up here. And it may be that in the course of your li life, you go from being born again to being reprobate to being born again to being reprobate many times, maybe countless times in the course of your life. And it may be that you've gone all the way up here, you've been born again for years, but at the very end, you don't believe and you've uh, grieved the Spirit. And at the end of the day, you end up outside of God's presence. And maybe this guy who lived his whole life here ends up there. But there's a lot of movement on this chart. But that's kind of the basics of what the Arminian system will be. There, there will be all sorts of uh, tweaking of this.
in a variety of different ways. Um, you know, uh, the, all sorts of different kind of ways to understand predestination that doesn't mean that God actually predetermines that anyone will be saved or won't be saved. But any questions for me about this basic sort of scheme here? So when Arminian would ask for that to be changed to St. Leo Monson. I don't know if I understood that. Oh, St. Yeah, okay, all right. Uh, I'm going to think about that. Um, thank you. Thank you. Well, I'll, let me say this. I've been informed that in the recordings, the questions are not actually heard, and then I'm going to need to repeat them in order to uh, make sense of my answers. I'm not going to repeat that, so I'm just <laughs> going to let that be. Yes, did you have a question for me? Great question. I mean, Jerry's got a great question. So for the Arminian scheme, the way that anyone could ever choose God is that in, in a remarkable way, that's the work of Christ, is that he makes you able to choose better than your nature. So you're in kind of this halfway place of not yet saved, but able to exercise almost like an, an Adamic free will before there was. That's right. Yeah. We are definitely driving home what will be a Calvinist critique. They're going to say, you really don't believe in depravity at all. You say you do, but there's no one actually living in this state. Everyone you ever meet actually is living in this state where they functionally have free will. So you can talk about depravity, but no one's actually there in your scheme. And these are the sorts of critiques they're going to raise. And to be honest with you, one of the biggest issues that that people are going to have with this in, in the Reformed tradition and really just Christianity um, historically is that what this virtually does is it places the reins of salvation into human people um, as to where they're going to end up, whether or not God is going to have a bride that is peopled with you know this number or that number is functionally and at the end of the day dependent on humanity. Really, what's at stake here is the sense that, that salvation is actually a miracle at all. At the end of the day, the reason why you are saved and the other person is not is not because of some miraculous working of God's supernatural power in your soul. is because of something you have chosen to do of your own free will welled up from yourself. And see, this, you'll have to remember, is the age of rationalism. This is where the world, in terms of philosophy, is going in this direction of believing in the inherent abilities of man, humanism, a secular worldview is on the rise. And the feeling is that Arminianism is it's just right there on the edge, placing all of this power in man, all of this trust in the ability of the, of the human will to raise itself up above its own depravity. Um, it... It, it, it's just a, a hop, skip, and a jump, to use the language of track and field, from out-and-out out seculars. And that's the feeling of the Calvinists, the Reform, the Orthodox in Holland. Yes? Would you uh, uh, quickly explain what the Arminian view and the Calvinist view of free will is? Sure. Well, we'll go to the Calvinist view in a minute, so maybe I'll go there next. But I mean, I would say the key for the Arminian view is the, the, the phrase autonomous free will. It's the idea that, and you can break it down to this, at the end of the day, for an Arminian, for a will to be free, for a decision to be free, it must be the product of a unipersonal decision. What I mean by that is one personal unit, namely the human person, must be solely responsible for producing that decision, whatever it may be. For a Calvinist, we're going to say that a free will does not have to be a unipersonal decision. We can say that you will something, but the supervening will beyond it is the divine will of God, and it can be acting and working in every single human decision right along with the human person without diminishing the reality of the human person who's making that decision. And here's the thing, that's deeply paradoxical. But for us as Trinitarians, it should be uh, deeply comfortable and familiar because what do we believe? Is there any being in reality that makes unipersonal decisions? Jesus. Well, see, and that's the thing. Jesus says, I don't do anything of my own free will but what my Father intends for me to do. 
all three persons of the Trinity only make decisions that are absolutely in accordance with the other two persons of the Trinity, which when that's your standard, your highest vision of freedom, that God himself, all three persons of the Trinity only ever act on the basis of a will that interpenetrates and overlaps with and perfectly accords with two other wills, we ought to be comfortable when we come to the matter of salvation saying that God can be working and acting in us as the first and primary cause and mover without diminishing our reality as persons. That's something we should be especially prepared to say. At the end of the day, to be honest with you, Arminianism, it was felt, was just a step away from Socinianism. And there was a lot of interaction between um, the two uh, Socini- Socinianism denies the Trinity, denies the dual nature of Christ, and denies you know, predestination and Calvinism. And yes, sir. Uh, where was the Catholic Church in Rome <laughs> then and now on, on this side? Where, where they are? I, I, down in hell? I don't know. I'm just kidding. I'm just, just kidding. Just kidding. No. <laughs> no. Are they more, do they tend to lean more Arminian? Yeah. Well, yeah, basically post-Trent, they're going to be significantly more Arminian in ascribing significantly more power to the human free will prior to regeneration to opt for, you know, baptism, which is regeneration in their system. Obviously, you can lose regeneration in their system. If you remember the scheme that we did when we're talking about Luther, it's like, yeah, you can be falling off the salvation train a lot. So at that point, yeah, they, they're definitely, you know, more on the Arminian side of things. The big difference for the Arminians is they're going to say they're not going to make baptism the, the fundamental means of being born again. Your free will is actually the number one thing that's going to get you from the uh, prevenient question mark phase to, to being up into the, the salvation phase. Yeah. Well, I mean, it'd be similar to what the Reformed would make of it. They would say that it's a sign and seal, probably, of salvation by grace alone through faith alone, that it would you know, be something that fosters salvation. It's a point and a mark and from which you leave a worldly community to a living community. And in that sense, there's a sort of new life that's experienced. But at the end of the day, they would still maintain you can be saved apart from baptism. You never step off the yo-yo till you die and you're glorified. Yeah, that's a great question. All of those questions are going to get raised. And if you answer yes, then you're going to be squarely in, the, in, in a Baptist camp. If you say no, then you're, you're going to be more classically what um, you know the Armenians might be. But you're, you bring up a great point. And, and you're making me think, so I'll have to, I, I want to look and see if they'd actually say you get baptized again, because that would land them in even hotter water in Holland at the time. And notably, this is a time when there is a state church. The state church is Reformed or Calvinist. The whole country is going to get involved in this controversy, because as we're going to see, he ends up in his Leiden professorship making for himself some um, disciples and followers. Uh, uh, Vorstius, I do believe, is German. I could be mistaken, but he's He's at least from the East, and he's uh, going to follow him, I believe. And then uh, S- Simon Episcopius will be another one of his rather vocal followers. And these are guys who are really going to develop the Arminian system. Now, here's what might surprise you. that They have a national synod called. And you know who the main impetus for this synod actually is? It's King James I of England. He reads one of the works of Vorstius and is like, what the heck is this? This is not Orthodox theology at all. This, now remember, King James is, you know, one of the first kings of the United uh, Stuart dynasty, um, both uh, England and Scotland together. He is coming from, you know, Scottish, you know, Presbyterian land. And he's like, I thought we were all agreed about this stuff. And he is not pleased. And he actually tells the, um, the, the uh, Dutch church that they're going to have to break, you know, what would otherwise be friendly Christian communion with one another if they don't deal with this. Likewise, Maurice, uh, the Prince of Orange, which is, uh, you know, a French territory, he too is like, what, what's the deal? Like the world is not happy about this. This is a very different sort of age where you're feeling pressure from other nations to to deal with your theological problems. And that they do. And so you have the Synod of Dort. And you know what? One would just, okay, go ahead. What's your question? 
Is it? Yes, you're probably right. It's probably the French-Dutch border. Yeah, that's exactly where I think it is. Yeah, good point. All right. But no, I, I want to say, look it up. I, 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 I thought for some reason I was associating him with, um, with uh, northern France, but good point. All right, so the Synod of Dort, it's composition. 39 teaching elders, 18 ruling elders, five uh, theological professors. It actually is representing seven countries um, or seven different regions, at least Great Britain, East and West Switzerland. So you have Geneva and Zurich. The Palatinate, which is, um, well, you can just go, go to the map, which is uh, kind of, oh, just so, uh, north of um, Bavaria, northeast of Bavaria. Um, delegates were called upon from France, but uh, as you'll see, they don't make it. But here's the thing. This is actually the most international synod or council of people called together probably since the ecumenical councils of the early church going into the, the 8th and, and ninth centuries. It is the closest thing to a European meeting of doctors in the faith, Christians in the faith, uh, that you really have um, after those initial years of Christendom. So this is a remarkable, remarkable thing. I um, mean, there's nothing quite like this when it comes to other Reformed confessions. And they all meet at Dordrecht. And they had a way of determining it. It was like, you know, each of the major Swiss cities got to send one teaching elder and, you know, or, you know, one ruling elder in these other countries got to send, you know, so many teaching elders per country or something like that. But at the end of the day, um, the French delegates are prevented from going there because at this point things are really heating up in France with respect to the Reformation, and he doesn't want to help um, the Reformed cause at all. Well, the composition of this assembly is that there is one person who self-identifies as an Arminian out of 86 people present. Um, you know, that <laughs> this was not going to look good for, um, for anyone of that persuasion at all. And so at the end of the day, um, I should note this, the English delegates who came were, were actually all part of the Church of England, what you'd call Anglican. There are five of them. And what's, what's cool to note is that in its inception, the Anglican Church was involved in the Synod of Dort. They signed on to it. They voted in favor of its, its fi uh, final you know, complete, completed form. The Anglican Church is really at root in terms of its soteriology, how you get saved, Calvinistic. And in later years, you're going to see they, they really sour on the Presbyterians and those who end up producing the Westminster Confession. But at this point in history, they really had a deep, rich brotherhood between them. And so Joseph Hall, who is probably one of their um, leading members, he says this about uh, the Synod of Dort. He says, there is no place upon earth so like heaven as the Synod of Dort, and where he, that's uh, Christ, should be more willing to dwell. Um, he looked at this as a, a very, very um, rich body of faith. And in fact, when the Anglicans are in uh, Holland, they actually not only will worship with, you know, the Dutch Reformed, but they will actually from time to time fill pulpits, and they will acknowledge, you know, the pastoral ministry and calling of those in the Dutch church. I mention all of this because when Anglicanism under Archbishop Laud and in the coming years kind of sours on, on more extreme branches of the Reformation, they develop a theory of church government which says, essentially, any ecclesiology where they don't have bishops who succeed from the apostle Peter in one way or another, it's not a real ministry. So they would essentially say that about all the Presbyterians of their time. But remarkably, at the Synod of Dort, <laughs> this doesn't sound like a guy who doesn't believe in the genuineness of the pastoral ministry of the presbyters in, in Dort. And so it, it's valuable to note that there is a strong tradition in Anglicanism that is reformed. But all that said, here's the conclusion. It's a unanimous conclusion because the one Arminian leaves, and um, that's, what you, <laughs> that's what you get. Um, and basically what you get is uh, instead of their vision of uh, election, you have unconditional election, limited atonement, total depravity, irresistible grace, perseverance of the saints. And I'll try to put this in a diagram. Remember what they said about election. Election and, and predestination essentially only means that if you believe God has determined that you will be saved. 
It doesn't mean that he's determined who will believe or who will be saved. So that's really conditional election. It's like God is predestined that if you believe, you will be among the chosen to be saved. In, in which case, your being elect is based on the condition of, of your free will. Well, it's a totally different scheme. So let's look at this scheme. The Reformed want to hold on to this vision of total depravity that's actually real. This is a real condition and state in which you will find people. And um, it's not purely hypothetical and immediately removed by the grace of Christ that you're, you're in a condition of having and possessing a freedom to either choose or not choose the gospel. And Christ, in that respect, is completely out of reach for you. I mean, he, you, you're bent on unbelief. And, you know, Christ, in that respect, believing in him, trusting in him is, is impossible for you in your condition. That's the picture. And it's important you guys all understand that. As for how likely it was that any one of you would have believed in Christ left only to the you that was birthed from your mother, the likelihood is zero. Zero percent. It's as likely as a dead person walking out of their grave. That's the actual condition of all of us in our unbelief. And so then the picture is, is that Christ is more like a, well, and I'll just throw out the, you know, the, the classic proof text. You could throw out many for all of these, and I have them on here if anyone wants to consult them later. But in Genesis 6, 5, the Lord saw that the wickedness of man was great on the earth and that every intent of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. And this is pretty outspoken. Only evil is flowing from you continually. Or you take 1 Corinthians 2, 14, but a natural man does not accept the things of God, the Spirit of God, for they are foolishness to him. He cannot understand them. That is the condition and state of your mind. It sounds insane. You can't receive it. Or Matthew 7, bad tree bears bad fruit. And then he goes on to say, nor can a bad tree produce good fruit. <laughs> Belief in Christ is good fruit, if anything, Right? And so at the end of the day, this is the condition of man. It's a real condition. And so the situation is that Christ must come into this world like a crater, scooping out of this depraved mass those who are going to be encompassed in the work of his cross. And so what this is, is a picture of particular redemption. Christ reaches into the mass of the depraved and he grabs out of it by his sovereign might and power, his people. And so what is the, the cause or impetus of all of this? I mean, first off, um, let's do the proof text. The idea is not that the cross makes you free to choose Jesus. The idea is that the cross is a, a, an actual transaction where you were bought with the blood of Christ. You think about the, 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 the language of a purchase of you. That is something that once made has got to have its effect, or it says something about the value of Christ's blood. Was it not sufficient to purchase you or to buy you? These are the sorts of things that the Reformed will say. And so it says you were bought with a price, or you have this one. Husbands, love your wives just as Christ also loved the church and gave himself up for her so that he might sanctify her, having cleansed her, that he might present to himself the church in all her glory. It's the picture of him going and rescuing a definite people, his bride. And, and you take John 10, where Jesus says, I'm the good shepherd and I lay my life down for the sheep. And he goes on to say to the Pharisees, but you do not believe because you are not my sheep. I came to purchase a people. Your unbelief is not due to the fact that I gave you power of free will to choose one way or the other, but it's the fruit of the fact that you're not my sheep. And so what happens is that Christ is sent into the world to actually purchase a specific people that people is predestined by God in eternity past, which is to say God chose to save a people from eternity past. Christ is the very conduit of God's grace through whom God works and acts on a depraved man. He divides humanity into two. By his irresistible grace, he draws out of that mass of unbelief his people, and they are born again. His grace as it operates in you is irresistible. Now you have two different types of people, people on this track and people on that track. And once you're on that track, we'd say you're part of the golden chain. We're actually memorizing that scripture as a family. Anybody got it? And those whom he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his son so that he 
would be the firstborn among many brethren. And these whom he predestined, he also called. And these whom he called, he also justified. And these whom he justified, he also glorified. That is to say, there is this unbroken chain that when God has bought you in Christ, poured out his irresistible grace on those objects of predestination, you will be born again. We call that effectual calling. You will manifest faith. You will, in the course of time, immediately upon manifesting faith, be justified and declared righteous in Christ, adopted as sons and daughters. You will persevere, and you will at death and at the resurrection be glorified in eternity. This is the picture. This is the scheme that you are kept, and it's a miracle. And that is the nature of how salvation works. It is a miracle that any one of you right now knows Jesus Christ. And if you've believed in him, you are going to be kept by him. If you believed in him, you're going to be sanctified. I always like to explain to people that this is like the most liberating thing to ever know about your salvation. It's like being told going into a basketball game that you absolutely cannot lose. Now think about if you're like the worst basketball player ever. You'll be taking three-point shots from half court. It's going to have to go in somehow, some way or the other. You've already been told you're going to win. That's the picture. That's this sort of liberation that one has when they understand salvation to be such a mighty and um, sovereign work of God. And of course, you could point to any number of scriptures for all of these points, and they're in the PowerPoint. You guys can look through them if you want, but you can produce scores of them for each point. And that is what the Synod of Dort ultimately finds. We just did the golden chain in Romans 8, 29 to 30. Um, great scripture proof text for uh, a shorter catechism when it says, um, what are the benefits uh, that follow from uh, effectual calling, You know, justification, adoption, sanctification. Um, but that is the conclusion. So at the end of the day, here's the picture. These, these are two different orders of salvation. It's called the Ordo Salutis in, in Latin. For the Reformed, we say that God calls you effectually. And what does that mean? It's just it accomplishes what God intended it to do. It's this secret calling that works in your soul. And do you know why we pray for people? <laughs> because we believe God can actually effectually call them. And I always like to ask you, the Arminian, you know, what, why, what, what are you praying for when you pray for someone's salvation? Like for God to try harder to work on that totally autonomous will of a, a person? I mean, but it's totally autonomous. Like, what are you asking for? What we're asking for, you know, in this case is an effectual calling for God to do what the person can't do from within. And then we'd say the fruit of that is, you know, you, you have a new nature. It's regeneration. They'd say... You have conditional calling. It may result in faith, may not. Then after you believe you have new life, and this is one of the biggest differences for Calvinists and Arminians, we would say you have to be born again and made into a person who can produce what are otherwise holy choices before you're going to exercise faith and repentance and um, belief in the gospel. The Arminian is going to say you're going to have to somehow believe in Jesus beforehand, and then you're going to be given a new nature that is somehow inclined to obedience and holiness. And you go, well, how do I believe in in the Lord if I'm not inclined to obedience and holiness first? And of course, in the course of time, conditional perseverance, whereas we believe that there's going to be perseverance of any genuine saint, and then finally glorification. Okay, so you guys got um, the Synod of Dort. Any questions for me about um, what was concluded there? The virtue of the Synod of Dort, say, over the Westminster is just, just how much they focus. It is just, the whole thing is just on this. It's just on Calvinism, I mean, which is awesome. I mean, it's thick, it's deep, it's rich um, in the implications of it, whereas Westminster is going to be dealing with all the broad points of theology. Yeah, Dad. Uh, so that second point down on the left, yeah. yeah. Yeah, well, so it'd be even this. It's God giving you a nature that can um, appreciate who Christ is and what he does. It's like taking your, I mean, illumination is often associated with that, taking away from you blindness so that it's like now all of a sudden you can see who Christ really is. And what are you going to do when you see that? You're going you're gonna to believe in him and you're going to receive him and you're going to love him. But it's like removing the scales from your eyes. So they're going to love 
you know, the, you know, Damascus Road experience. You know, what happens in miracle is what is happening in our soul, uh, that what is removed is that hard heart and given a heart of flesh. And out of that, what are you going to have but faith in, in the Savior? So, yeah. Well, I'm going to go to the next one. Um, following the Synod of Dort, um, we saw that Synod of Dort, we, what, what year did we say? I think we said November 3rd, 18, 1618. Yeah. Well, man, that... <laughs> That is kind of the, the calm before the storm. You know, the, the situation with Arminius is nothing like what's going to erupt after that, which is the Thirty Years' War. See, the Reformation, 1517, All Saints Day, um, it's about 100 years later, 1618, where the fallout politically takes place. Um, they've been holding back the dam for a while. But this is where, at the end of the day, the Holy Roman Empire realizes they're losing way, way too much to look the other way. In fact, one of the biggest disputes is who owns the churches. If everyone in Northern Germany became Lutheran and the whole congregation had been worshiping in this building for years and years and years and years that was a Roman Catholic built building, but they're Protestant now, who owns the building? The people who occupy it or the people who once built it? This is a big deal. These are the sorts of things that you have major issues over even today when it comes to church property, right? Well, what it turns into is the division of all of Europe. The Habsburg family, which is Austrian and at the center of the Holy Roman Empire, who is strictly allied with Spain at this point. It's basically one Holy Roman Empire. Bavaria, so southern Germany, always a Roman Catholic stronghold. Um, And the Catholic League, which are various German states that are, are Roman Catholic against Saxony, Brandenburg, which are the northern German states, Holland, Sweden, and France. And ironically, France, they're a Catholic country. This just goes to show that this isn't strictly about religion. Um, It's also just about power. And the French, although they're a Catholic country, they don't like the Holy Roman Empire, so they're with the Protestants by and large. You'll notice the English aren't involved because they're going to be involved in their own issues and civil war in the course of time here. And so this is all of Europe at war. In fact, the Ottomans, the, uh, the Ottomans in um, uh, Turkey, they're going to support the, the Protestant essentially forces as well because they also hate the Holy Roman Empire. The real hero of the war who, if you're going to assign a winner to a war that kills 8 million people in Europe, about a third of the continent, um, If you're going to talk about a winner, you would say the Protestants won because they essentially do hold their territories as Protestant states. And uh, Gustavus Adolphus, the um, the what really the king of the the Swedish Empire, is the the great um, liberator. He comes down with his army from uh, Sweden, and he has a a tactic of essentially. being kind to the towns that uh, he overtakes and <laughs> invades instead of like eating all of their food and you know ravaging the populace and he's beloved by the um by the german states when he is is going through them and um he just he, he really exudes the sort of he kind of a george washington-esque sort of um valor and um dignity in war but he actually does die in the course of the conflict, despite the fact that he essentially is the the leading force to liberate the Protestants. So that said, that's what's going on in Europe. And now we turn, after we look at this cool math, uh, we'll turn back to England. But this is what the world looks like. Uh, Roman Catholic rule, this is is actually a German map, which is what I could find on the internet. Um, Roman Catholic, you know, uh, holds in Spain and France and Italy. Um, and really most of Southern Central Europe. But Lutheranism all the way in the North and one form of the Reformed faith in uh, Switzerland, Holland, and then pushing into England and to Scotland. And, um, you know, there there actually should be dots over here in Romania that gets pretty colorful, but believe it or not, in Hungary, there's actually a a solid Reformed representation. In fact, they had um, in Debrecen, They had um, just a beautiful church there that some people called the Protestant Rome because it was so beautiful. Um, But it's often forgotten in the list of Reformed influences in Europe. That said, we turn to England, and this is uh, with the Westminster Confession. Now, King James, man, 
King James, I'm going to, this guy, his rap sheet, Synod of Dort, like he was pretty instrumental in making that happen. Okay, Jamestown, the pilgrims, that's all on his watch, man, in America. And then, of course, the King James Bible. I mean, that's, that's a pretty mean uh, list of, of things to have had some hand in during your monarchy. But he's followed by Charles I, and it's during this time period that um, things really heat up in England. There are those who do not appreciate, don't appreciate the degree to which the Church of England has reformed the various errors and traditions of Rome. If I ever come out at church looking like this, guys, this is when you know it's all over, okay? It's, you should have known before then, but if that ever happens, that's the moment. Not saying if, you know, there's a solid tradition of just a simple black robe among, you know, the Puritans, the Reformed, you name it. But what's going on here? Like, this is something else, man. That's a lot of flair. Well, <laughs> Charles I is raised Scottish Presbyterian. But here's the thing. Monarchs start to realize pretty quickly that there is a sort of natural affinity between the way Rome runs the church and the way that they would like to run the country. And it soon becomes clear that if you want to have a stranglehold grip on the populace and unquestioned authority, it's more easily done when you have an archbishop running your church, who is the one guy who's in charge of everything and answerable to you, that at the end of the day, you can wield greater control over things. So it's not, it shouldn't be surprising that monarchs had a certain preference, not infrequently, for some form of ecclesiastical hierarchy. And so in England, we saw at the beginning of it all, you had King Henry VIII, the tyrant, if ever there were one, and he was always kind of waffling on how reformed he wanted to be. Well, as things progress into the reign of Charles I, people are increasingly demanding the reformation of the church in a variety of ways. First off, the Book of Common Prayer is morphing into this thing that is requiring of its ministers the wearing of vestments, this stuff, uh, keeping a liturgical calendar and keeping it in a way and requiring it of people in such a way that it's kind of strangling, you know, it re requiring and forcing them to engage in everything from fasts and things like that and to, to be present at different services and things like that beyond the Lord's Day. Preaching from a lectionary, which is to say you don't get to choose your passage of Scripture, and in fact, you don't even necessarily get to choose the sermon. You're going to preach one of those old sermons that, that Cranmer wrote in a time when you can understand why he wrote sermons for the clergy. It's because they literally had never studied the Bible in their entire life, and it was a good idea then, but now you have all these guys who are actually trained to preach. Likewise, of course, episcopacy. It's having, instead of a presbytery as your highest court, having bishops and archbishops as your highest individual heads of the church. And of course, it's Archbishop William Laud who is really, really pushing this stuff forward and to a degree that is, is leaving those who are Protestant um, in a more serious degree and committed to purifying the church, Puritans, as we learned about in our last lecture, they're not going to have it. So this is kind of one of the breaking points. It is going to be required of all clergy, all lawyers, all physicians, basically everyone who has any sort of position at all. That you're going to say something along the lines of, I do swear that I do approve the doctrine and discipline or government established in the Church of England by archbishops, bishops, deans, and archdeacons, etc., as it stands, etc., etc. Hmm. What could you maybe put in that etc. right there? What am I actually pledging to? I swear to support etc. <laughs> what? Okay, well... That could mean anything and everything. And when you've lived through eras like Bloody Mary, who's requiring the reinstitution of the Catholic faith in your continent, who's requiring any number of different things, how do you, how do you make an oath to etc. here? The etc. oath became one of the main onerous points of the Puritans who were not satisfied with the purification of the church at that point. One of the main rallying cries that we can't get behind this. Well, what happens is, is that when this book of church order and this etc. oath is being imposed upon people all throughout the land, 
Scotland immediately uh, opposes this tyranny. They have a 30,000 man lay army. Remember, both of the kingdoms are united at this point in, in the Stuart monarchy, and they're ready to go to war right then and there. In fact, they call it the Bishop's Wars. But they sign what is called the National Covenant, or at least many people do, in Grey Friars Hall in, um, in Edinburgh. And um, this is supposed to be a representation of it. And um, you have the, the cry, no king but Christ. Anyone who tries to impose as if king over the church how we're going to worship, that's just not the role of the king. You can't do that. And you can't impose this upon us. And this is where we get the name covenanter. Someone who refuses on the ground of uh, the tyranny of the king or the civil government to determine what worship is going to look like. They've covenanted to not allow such a thing to occur and to take up arms at the end of the day to um, oppose it. And so Scotland, they've had a Church of England for years. They're like, you're not changing this. We've already had this in place. But in England, this situation is going to be more complex. So really, at the end of the day, the Scottish, um, they, they're not going to be the focus because England's going to go into a civil war. So that's what's going to happen. What happens is the parliament makes a decision that it cannot be dissolved uh, except by the consent of every single member. Now, why would you want to dissolve parliament? Well, because you want to act like the king and reign from on high. And so this begins the long parliament, lasts from 40, 1640 to 1660 for 20 solid years. They don't ever um, dissolve uh, any meeting of, of parliament. It just goes on and on and on, and they're passing laws, and they're doing all sorts of things. And it stems from their unwillingness to pass Charles I's budget because they want to do a bunch of other things as well. And that's where the positioning and maneuvering is going on. What ends up happening is that Charles uh, brings ac accusations against five members of parliament that they are seditious. And um, at that point, uh, he's going to war with parliament in certain respects. And he's outnumbered by Puritans. And Charles actually flees London with those who are loyal to him. And one of his biggest mistakes, some will say, is that those members of parliament who sided with him also fled. But what did that do except for leave parliament actually just completely Puritan at that point? Everyone in the parliament is of the mind that the church needs to be purified. This begins the English Civil War from 1642 to 1651. And, um, of course, Oliver Cromwell is going to be the leader of the, um, of the uh, Puritan uh, forces in the, the New Model Army. And he's generally thought to be a military genius. He, he wins all of his battles, and um, he eventually essentially becomes something of a king. But what you have to understand is that in this time frame, the, the parliament itself charges a body of ministers to draw up a new form of government for the Church of England, to draw up a new guide for worship, to revise the 39 articles, which was their confession, and, and to make a, a more thorough confession, and to make a new catechism. This is where we get the Westminster Confession, the Westminster Larger Catechism, then they made a shorter catechism so that it could be more easily memorized. And that was the charge. So you look at this as a national government charging a body of people to draw up a confession. And what that composition looked like is it the main drafters of that confession were ministers. Westminster divines is what they're called. So you get a degree in divinity. But they also had, as part of that assembly, members from the House of Lords and the House of Commons. And this is a uh, political cartoon. The royalists are the sea. They're in Noah's Ark, and they are producing the, the Westminster, um, all the Westminster documents. And um, yeah, that's exactly the sort of... <laughs> That's how they viewed the world at the time. And, yeah? So this um, charge to the Westminster Assembly was done during the long... Yeah, um, the long parliament. parliament. Yeah, so I think, I think if you look at our timeline, just going back to the beginning, yeah, it's, it actually... Yeah, Charles is t technically still king, and it's in that time, but, I mean, the parliament's kind of doing their own thing. And... Um, He's at war, so I mean, you can see it's about one year into the war. 1642 is when the war starts, but yeah, and it outlasts the war by just a couple years.
In any case, to give you a picture of what's going on, um, 100, plus minus 120 ministers. Some people can't be there the whole time. Some are sick. Some never make it. It's roughly what it is. They have Scottish advisors from the Scottish church who are actually very influential. And then they have lay assessors from the House of Lords and Commons. And the key is to understand that you have even different visions of how the church should be governed between essentially Presbyterian, really congregational or independent, and then Episcopal. And I'll show you the makeup broadly right here. Essentially, the greater part of the group is Presbyterian by far. So 101 really outspoken Presbyterians. Then you have the Scottish um, adv advisors and Samuel Rutherford, George Gillespie, very influential members of the assembly. They're obviously Presbyterian too, so you could say 107. But then you do have 11 very influential um, uh, congregationalists. And that's to say they, they agree with our polity in every way, except for they don't, have a, they don't think there's a necessity of having a presbytery to be a faithful church. So you would be reformed, you'd have ruling elders, you'd have teaching elders, but you wouldn't necessarily have a presbytery. And then there are just a few Erastians who held that the king should be the head of the church, not a presbytery, and that generally would work more with a hierarchical view. John Lightfoot is actually a brilliant, brilliant scholar, and he was of the Erastian persuasion. But as you can see, the vast majority are Presbyterian. And um, here are just some of the guys who are uh, more influential. William uh, Twice is the prolocutor, which means he's kind of the moderator of the entire thing, and he's a high predestinarian, super lapsarian, as we'll see in a little bit. So let me tell you about the broad features of it. And I think Westminster is widely regarded as the most thorough, um, well-organized, balanced of the confessions. I mean, it's, it's kind of the high point of, of Reformed confessions and the products of this age of Reformed scholasticism. And of course, you would want to know there was debate and consensus and discussion about every single point. Uh, this, it, you can read the, the discussions and how thoroughly in different committees all of these different points were debated. And it's important to note that from the beginning, there were differences of opinion. It's so one of the reasons why we allow for exceptions to the confession, because the people who wrote it didn't all 100% agree and had the exact you know, conformity with one another. But there was this broad idea of submission to brethren. And we, what can we produce that we do agree on? And so... I'll just show you with the Westminster Confession, and those numbers represent chapters, there are 33 chapters. There's just an incredible logic to it. It begins with your authority, Scripture. So you have uh, the Westminster Statement on Scripture, which we'll talk about in a little bit, and it's just brilliant. But then, you know, that's how we're getting all of this theology. Then you deal with those things that are eternal, God and his decrees. These things are not, you know, time-bound. They precede all of time. So that's chapters 2 and 3. Then you have the works of God within time. Obviously, creation, his providence throughout time, the fall of man. Then a discussion of the covenants, the covenant of works, the covenant of grace. And then, of course, what Christ does in time. And that's called the Historia Salutis. Those are the events in time that work out to human salvation. That's followed by what you call the ordo salutis, which is how an individual comes to saving faith and comes to salvation in an individual life. You call that the ordo salutis. You'll note that's one of the biggest focuses of the Westminster Confession. What does it mean to go from being in a condition of depravity to being saved and at the fullest extent having assurance of your salvation. See what I mean? And of course, you can see the things we saw in the Synod of Dort, free will, um, defined in that Calvinist sense that we had talked about with a great question from Alex. But then you have that golden chain, effectual calling, justification, adoption, sanctification, and then you know discusses the various components of um, what we're doing in all this, saving faith, repentance, and um, you know good works that flow from it. But then following that, you have your Christian life, your Christian duty. And discussion of the law of God, liberty of conscience, worship, oaths and vows, the civil magistrate, and marriage. This is Christian duty, those things in your Christian life that you are called to do. And then in chapters 25 to 31, you have the church. What is the church? How do you define it? What's the communion of the saints, the sacraments, baptism, Lord's Supper, church censures, discipline, synods and councils, and then it ends with what happens after death and what happens in eternity. 
And so it's just, it's an incredible, look at the breadth of what it's covering. You look at the logic of, you know, how it unfolds. It's just, it's so deep and rich. And I think what especially renders um, the Westminster standards so remarkable is that the larger catechism so thoroughly expounds the Christian life, not just orthodoxy, right belief, but orthopraxy. And this is what the larger catechism looks like. Again, it opens with a very practical question. What, what's the whole point of life? Well, it's to glorify God and to enjoy him forever. Okay, well, how do I do that? You've got to know who God is, and that's right belief. And then I've got to know what he wants me to do. That's right practice. And then I, I need to know how he wants to be worshipped, and that's right worship. And so question one, man's chief end, two to five, basically what's our authority, which is scripture, which in turn, what it principally teaches is what man is to believe concerning God and what duty he requires of man. And so what is man supposed to believe about God? Well, five is, you know, theology. Six through 11 is, you know, God, his decrees, creation, providence, fall, sin, covenant, Christ, person, work, and then union with Christ. That's the order salutis, which we saw a moment ago. That's your right belief. What's your right practice? Well, look at the weight given in the Westminster larger catechism to expounding the Ten Commandments. 53 questions. I mean, what girth is given to discussing what the Christian life is supposed to look like? That is one of the incredible contributions of the Westminster in comparison to, say, other confessions. No other confession has such a thorough discussion of the the sort of life that God has asked his people to pursue. And then, you know, also a rather rich discussion of the means of grace, you know, 152 to 196, another 50 questions and answers about the sacraments and those things. So there's balance to this. Some confessions really just focus on what we ought to believe. The Synod of Dort is really focused on this right here. Um, You know, other questions are, uh, or confessions are significantly more practical or deal more with worship, but there's an obvious balance in the Westminster standards, which is incredible. So what do you think people might say was one of the weaknesses of the Westminster standards? There are no weaknesses. Yeah. Here's the thing. where People will say every strength is a weakness. The more you say, the more you have to agree to to be a part of this thing. There's not as much room to, you know, uh, to say maybe we differ or disagree on a variety of different things. The 39 articles, that's 39 things you got to say you believe if you're going to be Anglican. You have a really strong view of the authority of the church and, and et cetera thing, I guess. But, but here, the breadth sometimes be, becomes something that scares a person away. Maybe someone's totally convinced of Calvinism. Like, yeah, I agree with that. Like, I don't know about baptism and pedo-baptism and all that. Well, you're not Westminster then. Or maybe someone says, oh, yeah, I'm totally doctrine of the Trinity. I'm, I, under, I believe this doctrine of God here. Um, yeah, you know, I totally believe this thing about the fall and original sin, but, you know, I don't know if the fourth commandment is still binding today. Well, you're not good with Westminster in its exposition of the commandments. And you see, so in some respects, people would look at it and go, well, it says so much. And so, for example, J.I. Packer, great Reformed theologian, he stayed in the Anglican Church forever, but he said, I think the Westminster Confession is the greatest confession ever written. But I prefer to be in the Anglican Church because I just... I want to have a broader thing. Now, obviously, you know where I fall down. I mean, this, this is what I love. And, um, but it's one of those things where you have to recognize that's the hard thing is this can be intimidating from someone on the front end looking in. Like, how do I sign on and go, I agree with all of that. And that's why membership in a PCA church is different than ordination. You can be a member of the PCA church by just believing in Jesus Christ as your Savior, promising to submit to the discipline of the church. So any questions for me? about this so far. Well, I'll go ahead and look at some of the high points with you real quick. Um, It is the Protestant doctrine of Scripture, without a doubt, chapter one, that goes down as one of the most famous and uh, remarkable productions of the Westminster Assembly. No other confession so thoroughly describes the attributes of Scripture, how Scripture is supposed to properly be interpreted, and the role of the Holy Spirit in it all. Westminster assigns four attributes to Scripture. 
Number one, that it's necessary. Necessary if you're going to be saved. There is no means of knowing God but through, um, it, it, salvifically, but through his special revelation in scripture. It's authority. Just say it is inherently authoritative, not because the church says it's authoritative, not because the Pope says it's authoritative. It is authoritative because it is the word of God and someone who's been regenerated, his ears will hear it as such. It's also sufficient. This is a big deal when you're talking about the Church of England. We do not need a mass of traditions that came from somewhere, we know not where, to help guide us in how we worship or to bind our consciences about what we can eat on a holy day, or whether we have to observe a holy day beyond the Lord's day. And the last one, do anyone know what perspicuity means? Uh, Something you do Oh. Uh, I'm not gonna repeat that one either. Uh, Perspicuity means clarity. The Bible is clear. It wouldn't help us much if the Bible was necessary, authoritative, and sufficient, but it was totally ambiguous. It really wouldn't be sufficient at that point, would it? It's the idea that the Bible, when one labors to interpret Scripture with Scripture, is sufficiently clear for us to do all that is necessary to please God in the course of a Christian life and to be saved. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. At what point does it become less? Because that's that's Mm -hmm. smaller. Right. More (laughs) Yeah. That's That's right. But there's some people that you talk to them about the Bible and they like it, Mm -hmm. but they kind of approach it as this mystical, like, Mm -hmm. I. That's a great point. Yeah, there is actually a tendency to treat the Bible as such a nebulous thing, and maybe it's there for comfort reading and and devotions, but nothing really definite should ever come from it. Whereas it just doesn't quite jive with there's no other name under heaven by which a man can be saved. And this sort of definite demand of, you know, exercising and placing faith in something concrete. And that's right. It's a great point. Also, it just wonderfully expounds how to properly interpret Scripture. It's not fundamentally by consultation of councils, creeds, even this one. That is not your ultimate authority. Ultimately, this confession itself is the product of comparing Scripture with Scripture. And as Ben said, relying on those 66 books. So we'd call the Westminster Confession itself a secondary standard. Our highest standard is Scripture. And it's helpful as a a springboard, a jumping point, and something to go, yeah, this is an excellent summary of Scripture. But we're always semper reformenda. We're always reforming and honing our understanding of the truth. And there are many, many wonderful questions to still write theology PhDs about and to you know grow in theology. But here's kind of a picture of things. What Westminster does not want anyone to think is that this is how we arrive at the conclusion the Bible is the word of God. We look at the Bible and we bring to bear upon it pure reason to say, is it rational or our intuition? What do I just merely feel like in a fleeting feeling? The church told me human authority. In all of these instances, what is the highest authority? Is it this thing over here? No, it's all of those things up there. This is what the world wants and like prove to me the Bible. It's like what they're saying is, I want you to appeal to pure reason, which I'm going to regard as higher than the Bible. I want you to uh, rely on um, you know, human authority or intuition or whatever, or experience. I'll give you an experiential challenge. That's the Book of Mormon. You know, you'll get a fuzzy feeling. Um, All of these sorts of nebulous ways of determining the authority of Scripture. This is not what Westminster wants. For you to go, by these tests, I regard this book to either be the Word of God or not be the Word of God. They'd say, actually, this whole enterprise is treating this as not the Word of God. It's treating these things as your highest authority. So the picture in terms of how we arrive at the authority of Scripture it is vitally related to the illumination of the Holy Spirit, the third person of the Trinity. And the Reformed faith has always been um, something that lays a special emphasis on the work of the Holy Spirit within it. In fact, the longest books on the Holy Spirit ever written were written by Reformed people. You didn't know that, I bet. I mean, John Owen's book on the Holy Spirit was the longest 
I, and Abraham Kuypers is probably second, and uh, you know that's a Dutch Reformed and an English Puritan. Um, but here's what they're going to say is going on. When you're a, an unredeemed sinner, the word of God comes to you and presents to you a gospel. It, it, first of all, a diagnosis of your depravity and your sin, and and the solution to it in Jesus Christ, the only propitiation for human sin. Effectual calling occurs where God the Holy Spirit sends his, his, excuse me, God the Father sends his Holy Spirit to illuminate your mind so that you are able to recognize the word of God as your highest verbal authority and revelation for all that you do. And you're going to hear Christ speaking in that word. And at the end of the day, what ultimately validates the scriptures is the Holy Spirit who operates in and through them by the the Father who ties those two things together and the Word of God itself speaking in it, the second person of the Trinity and your ability to recognize it as such. And now you, you have a totally different vantage point on everything. The Bible actually becomes your highest authority by which you judge your own autonomous reasoning. The highest authority by which you judge your intuition and you say that's a good or a bad intuition. Your highest authority by which you you judge every other human authority and even your experience and um, by which you suspend any sort of trust in anything else. And that is the difference. And that's why they're going to say the ultimate rule for interpreting Scripture is Scripture itself. Turning back to Scripture and going, well, if this passage is difficult, let me go to a passage that is more clear. Let's tie it all together. You're thinking about blood in Leviticus. You go, well, what's the deal with blood in the Bible? If I just try to look at Leviticus 17... I'm just going to leave really confused. And that's the vantage point that the Reformed set before um, the world in this confession of faith. And it's just a wonderfully deep chapter, that first chapter of the Westminster. Another major one would just be, uh, you know, uh, the, the discussion of the decrees, which is, how did God think when he was engaging in this predestination business? Did God first, here's super lapsarian, think, I want to save Nicaea Bosserman and Michael Morales and Scott Charnley. I want these people to be my people. And here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to ordain that there's going to be a fall into sin. And then there's going to be a Savior who I see. All men will be sinful. Then I'm going to send a Savior, Jesus, to get those three that I have ordained to redeem by that Savior If so, if you're thinking of it that way, you're a super lapsarian, which is to say that God chose who the elect were. He thought about who the elect were before he thought about or even contemplated mankind as fallen or as a savior coming or anything like that, in which case election of individuals was uppermost in your mind. Well, infralapsarianism makes it different. It's that God first thinks, I'm going to create a mass of human persons. I'm going to decree that by their own free will, they will lapse into sin. Then I am going to, of that mass of those who have lapsed into sin, I am going to contemplate saving Nicaea Bosserman, Michael Morales, and Scott Charnley. There, that act or decree as to who will be saved occurs after the fall, infralapsarian as opposed to supralapsarian. And of course, what the Arminians and and others, uh, hypothetical universalists are gonna wanna say is that maybe God thinks of it this way. I'm going to create mankind. I'll ordain that, or decree that they fall into sin. Then I will decree to send a Savior, Jesus Christ. And then after I have chosen to send a, a Savior, Jesus Christ, I will elect some people to believe in him or not believe in him and so be saved. And that's sometimes called hypothetical universalism, the idea that Christ is thought of at first as maybe potentially saving everybody, but then election limits it to a smaller group of people. Yes, sir. So this gets very subtle because the question is not whether he saw or chose people before the foundation of the world. The question is, in the order of God's thoughts, did he first think of a world that was fallen and then think of saving people from it? Or did he first think of the people whom he wanted to eternally have fellowship with and then ordain a decree for there to be a fall and a savior to get them? And see, here's what I want to say. (laughs) 
some people question the value of engaging in this discussion at all. Is there actually, you know, an order in the divine mind of what he prioritizes? Can we really talk about it that way? Herman Bavinck, Van Til, others would say there's something just dangerous about attempting to talk about how an infinite mind organized his... Does he even think discursively in the way that we do, where it's a strict, you know, one, two, three, four, or five propositional sort of thing? And we know that all of this happened before the foundation of the world, but can we say more about the order of the decrees? Well, notably in the Westminster Assembly, there were all, th well, there were these two especially, and there was a, a very small minority who had that position, and they debated it a lot. <laughs> so these are the sorts of things you can actually look into. But another matter of discussion was covenant theology. Okay, so God enters into a covenant with people. That's a defined relationship with people that generally defined by the covenant of works and the covenant of grace. But this sort of manner of viewing theology and how God develops his redemptive historical plan was developed incredibly and intensely uh, in the years, especially following the Westminster, but you get the beginning of a covenant theology. And here's the picture of it. Upon creation, you've got God and humanity, and they're in a defined relationship, a covenant. And Adam is the federal head of humanity. He represents everybody. That's why when he falls, we all fall. And you'd say that between God and man, there's a system of symbols like the tree of the knowledge of good and evil and the tree of life. There are these symbols, but there's no mediator between God and man. Man is standing before his creator. He's told that if he obeys the Lord, has a life of obedience, it will work out into inheritance of eternal life. I mean, Really, that's the implication of the tree of life. You keep eating it, you'll live forever and eventually enter the divine rest that God did after his own creation. Or it's very simple. If you eat of the other tree, you will die. That's the condition man's in. And it's called sometimes a covenant of works because man's obedience would eventually result in something like eternal life and inability to fall again or fall at all. And disobedience is going to work out into death. Sometimes it's also called the covenant of life. The idea that God has a defined plan or path for man to have um, long-standing life forevermore. Either name is fine. But the idea is after man falls into sin, you enter into what is a covenant of grace. That's the idea that your salvation is ultimately not going to be due to works that you do, but the works of a mediator, Christ, between God and man, who does what only man should and but what only God could, which is obey the law of God perfectly. And it has two distinct administrations, this covenant of grace. First, under the period of the law in the Old Testament, where Christ is represented by signs and symbols, the Paschal Lamb, all of the different sacrifices, the mercy seat, the priesthood. And you'd note that in the period of the law, the covenant people is more narrow, significantly smaller. And sometimes what kind of prevails in people's mind are these temporal promises that if they're obedient, they'll get to inherit the land of Canaan. Other times, you know, you can see the bigger picture that they have this sense that really eternal life is being offered to them in Christ. And of course, at the end of the day, that's true of all of the patriarchs who read that they saw Christ and they believed and from Abraham, you know, through the least of them. But then you have this new covenant administration of the gospel where the reality of Christ has actually come. There's less in the way of symbol. Look at what we do at church. We got one sacrament that we do regularly, one sacrament that we do once, and that's it. Way less in the way of symbols. And the emphasis is essentially on eternal promises. It's not to say there aren't temporal ones too. When Paul says to kids to obey your parents, he says it's the first commandment with a promise. that You'll live long in the land. It's still as true as it ever was. And reality is, is if you obey your parents, young folks, you probably will have a much more blessed life. So there's still temporal promises. They're not gone. But the emphasis is surely on eternal life, right? And um, this explanation of covenant theology, this basic outworking here, is expounded in the Westminster Confession, and um, it's one of the, the main confessions to expound a covenant theology of sorts. Well, I'm going to go ahead and just, we're just going to look at justification because we are kind of going long, but this is another wonderful contribution of the Westminster Confession. So, the question of what Jesus did to save you. 
Well, you guys have heard about the great exchange, that your sin is laid on Christ and his righteousness is laid on you. Now, how should you think about that? Everybody agrees in the Westminster Assembly that act an act of imputation or counting what you did to Christ as your, your sacrificial substitute took place. But the question is, how do we understand the counting of Christ's work in your stead on your behalf? And usually, think about evangelical Christianity. I'm sure many of you grew up in that. When you ask what Christ did for you, almost everybody's going to say one thing. Calvin, Calvin can't think of the answer to a theology question. We've done some family devotions. He'll, say, he'll raise his hand and say one thing. What does he say, Cece? Jesus died on the cross. This is one answer. He loves it. And it's right. You're saved because Jesus died for you. But here's the thing. What often gets left out of a presentation of the gospel is we're not just saved because Jesus died for us, but we're also saved by what he positively did for us. He kept the law where we did not. Okay, but how do we think about his obedience and his keeping the law? Well, the idea is he engaged in passive obedience. He suffered the curses that we deserved, but he also engaged in active obedience. Jesus got circumcised as required by the law, right? Jesus kept the, the Sabbath as required by the law. Jesus loved his neighbor as required by the law. Jesus did all of the positive things that the, re the law requires of you. And this really makes for a very complete picture of your salvation. There's nothing in the way of penalty that still needs to be applied to you. And there's nothing positively that you need to do that is still outstanding. But here's the thing. In the age of the Westminster Confession, the threat that was felt by the Westminster divines was not just the threat or the danger of justification by faith being denied. They were also worried about something called antinomianism. That is people who took justification by faith to mean, I don't have to worry about being obedient or doing any good works in my life anymore. In fact, I can be a total scoundrel. I can just believe in Jesus and bam, I'm in. That compelled certain divines, a small minority, to question that Jesus' active obedience is being imputed or counted to you. They'll say, Jesus died for your sin, yes. And if you're justified, you're gonna be heaven bound. But you need to pursue righteousness. You need to pursue that. And you don't just get to think of Jesus' obedience being credited to you. You need to pursue a life of obedience. Now, if you died right after believing in Jesus and you didn't have a robust life of obedience, they'd say you're still heaven bound. But they want to emphasize that you have to pursue a life of righteousness of your own. Thomas Gattaker was one of the more outspoken representatives of this position. His position is ultimately not what prevails, but you will notice in the wording that they're careful to put it in a way that a person who wants to emphasize that you're saved by Christ's passive obedience, they either don't want to talk about his active obedience or don't count that to be part of the process, could maybe get away with it. And here's how it's worded. And it's the bold part. Uh, Scott, you're always great for reading. accepting their person as righteous, not for anything wrought in them or done by them, but for Christ's sake alone, nor by imputing faith itself, the act of believing, or any other evangelical obedience to it as their righteousness, but by imputing the obedience and satisfaction of Christ unto them. All right, we'll stop there. It's the counting, they say, of both Christ's obedience, which would seem to be his active obedience, and his satisfaction, his suffering in their stead. Or is it just obedience and satisfaction is one thing, which is to say his obedience is his satisfaction and, and is, is being used epexegetically is what a grammarian would say, it, in which case it's the same thing. Well, I think the more compelling answer is that it's saying both Christ's active obedience and his passive obedience contribute to righteousness and salvation. 
but it, this way in which it is worded renders it such that the person who really want to emphasize that it's the satisfaction of Christ could still be within the Westminster Assembly, even though the stronger Reformed tradition is to say both the active and passive obedience are imputed. And that's one of the things that they, they did. Uh, you'll note as well, they want to say your righteousness is not infused in you. So it's not that you're inherently righteous when you believe because you're still a sinner. And, and that's against Roman Catholicism. It's not that the act of faith itself is like the one good work that you do, which is, sounds more like Arminianism. They're really trying to hit all the nails here. And they do an incredible job at it. Well, with all of that said, um, the outstanding issues, you know, when it comes to the Westminster, they, they are clear that there are ruling elders in the church, there are synods and councils in the church, which makes for being really Presbyterian, and um, the essential need for a presbytery. So there's someone beyond me who can keep me <laughs> accountable in a given church. And um, this is the fruit of it all. Well, at the end of the day, the Westminster Confession, here's its historical reception. Cromwell is victor victorious in 1646. Charles I is beheaded in 1649. And Cromwell becomes the lord and protector of England. Which at the end of the day seems um, remarkably like actually just being the king of England. And unfortunately, he was not nearly as good of a king as he was a revolutionary. And eventually, um, he gets ousted um, and the monarchy returns. And at the end of the day, England never adopts the Westminster standards as the standards of the Church of England. So they produce the most brilliant reform confession in history, and yet they don't adopt it. But the Church of England or Scotland does. And they only had six advisory commissioners there. And so it becomes the doctrinal standards of the Church of Scotland from that point forward. But here's the thing about it. Its greater influence is rather remarkable. It becomes the basis of other Reformed confessions. The Savoy Declaration basically is, is based on the Westminster. John Owen is one of the primary authors of it, but the only difference is it doesn't advocate for an explicitly Presbyterian ecclesiology. It also becomes essentially the basis of the London Baptist Confession, which is a Calvinistic Baptist Confession. And actually, the Shorter Catechism, I've told you guys before, becomes the single most printed Christian document other than Scripture in uh, Christian history. That is to say, um, it's reproduced all over the world. And in fact, it is the standard thing that the um, pilgrims and the Puritans are going to be looking to. I meant to say the, um, uh, you have the pilgrims and then... <laughs> The people who colonate in Massachusetts Bay, they are all going to be Westminster believing folk. Puritans. Yeah, they're Puritans, but I'm trying to, yeah, yeah, they're both, I guess that's it. It's just the Massachusetts Bay versus what you have um, in Plymouth are, are two different groups. Um, but in any case, yeah, so it's, it's a rather vast influence in the world from that point forward. So a remarkable production in this little window of time where Parliament is, is running, um, running the show in England. And uh, it was short-lived, but incredible fruit. So any final questions for me about all that we've discussed? Let's get past the civic magistrate. Civil magistrate right here? Yeah. Well, it's a whole chapter on the role and the duty of the civil magistrate. And um, the idea being that he is still under God, uh, but he's not over the church. He does not fundamentally govern the church. And that would be one of the main sticking points with the um, Erastian hierarchical uh, um, members of the assembly, which were very small in terms of actual divines. But there were some members of parliament who were still leaning to the idea that maybe the king should be the head of the church. And that's explicitly denied. But, what, but the things that are affirmed about the king in, in chapter 23 which has been changed in the American version after 1789. So see you in two classes and tell you why. But the king can still call a synod of the church. How would they exist unless the civil magistrate had called a synod of the church? So they'd say it's still in the hands or the right of a civil magistrate say, church, I need you to gather and produce a confession. And one of the major areas of development in the ensuing years, centuries really, is going to be in the realm of what do we believe about the relationship between church and state?
And when we talk about the formation of the Presbyterian Church in America, that's going to be one of the major points of difference. Any other questions? Yes, Cameron. Yeah, Cameron is asking the question. I've done miserably bad at repeating questions, but he's asking the question for all of those of you listening online. Uh, he's asking the question about whether or not the the idea of a balance of authority that which is inherent to to Presbyterianism had um, any direct influence on the formation of government in America. And um, I would say definitely, definitely does. And um, in two classes from now, we will discuss that in greater depths. Anyone else? Yeah. All right. Well, we've taken all that we can in this week. Thank you all for coming. Blessings, and I look forward to seeing you guys all again. Bye.